A while back, I posted a message here on YouTube asking you to share some of the coolest Python libraries that you're using and that you think more people should know about. So today, I'm going to share 15 libraries that are really awesome. I'm sure there's at least a few that you don't know about. These libraries can make your life easier, your code easier to read, and your projects more fun. Yes! So, let's dive in. The first library that I want to talk about is Pendulum, and this is a really cool utility to help you deal with dates and times. Actually, dealing with dates and times can be really a pain with different time zones, daylight savings, uh, leap years, etc., etc. So, what Pendulum actually does is it provides you with an easy interface to deal with dates and times and also computations of dates and times, like computing differences between dates and things like that. It's really easy to manipulate dates and times. For example, here you see that you can define a particular date in Europe, Paris, and then you can change the time zone very easily. You can uh, convert it to different daytime formats depending on your need. You can shift by adding days and things like that. What's cool about Pendulum is that it offers human readable dates, like what you see here, for example, or you can even do that for uh, date and time differences like this. And being a human myself, I really appreciate this. Next library I want to talk about is PyPDF. And this is a free open source Python PDF library. PyPDF can read PDF, can split them, merge them. It can even add custom data or watermarks. And you can even add passwords to your PDF files, which is really neat. I like this library a lot because it allows me to automate work where I have to deal with PDFs. Think of uh, contracts or invoices and PyPDF can handle those with ease. Next library is Ice Cream. Now, I don't know why this is called Ice Cream. I haven't figured that out yet. If you have an idea why it's called like that, post it in the comments. But Ice Cream is a library to make debugging easier. And what's really nice about this, well, apart from the beautiful image right here, obviously, is that instead of using print to debug or log, you can actually use Ice Cream and you write simply IC, so it's also a bit shorter. And what's nice about this is that the output is syntax highlighted. And that is actually really cool. And the second thing that it does is that it actually inspects itself. So normally if you would use print and you would print the result of a function like so, then you would just get the result, right? But what Ice Cream does is that it actually inspects the argument. So if you have this example, it's not just going to print the result of that particular function call, but it's actually also going to print the function and the arguments that were passed to the function. So this is incredibly useful for debugging. And it also does that for data types. In this case, we have a dictionary, and if we print the dictionary, then you can also see what is actually being printed. Or if you have a class with an attribute, then it also prints the name of the class and the name of the attribute. So by using Ice Cream for debugging, you just save a bunch of time printing variable names. It's really easy. Next library is Loguru. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. This is a library for logging, but simplified. One thing in particular that it simplifies is that you don't have to create a logger object. You can simply import the logger from Loguru and then use that. So that makes it almost as easy to use as just a simple print statement. What's nice about Loguru is that it has some built-in things that are really neat, such as uh, being able to automatically add colors to your log if your terminal supports that. You can simply define your favorite style by using markup tags, and then that actually works. There's other things as well, such as being able to deal with date times better than the standard logging package. And it also has built-in functionality to more easily view the entire stack trace. By the way, if you're enjoying these libraries so far, you might also be interested in joining my free weekly newsletter. In newsletter, I share the latest news from the Python world, as well as some other content that I don't share on the YouTube channel. Just go to ariamcodes.com to subscribe for free. If you don't like it, you can unsubscribe at any time. Next library that I want to talk about is Rich. And this is a Python library to write rich text with color and style to the terminal. What I really like about Rich is that it can actually render markdown. So you can write your markdown text and then it can write that to the console and then it's going to be styled nicely. And this even renders code blocks in Markdown with full syntax highlighting. So it's really cool. It can do way more things like, for example, displaying tables. It can show a progress display. And you can even do some basic styling like adding padding. The next library I want to talk about is ArcParse. 
And this is actually the only standard library that I'm including in this list. ArcParse, I've been using myself quite a lot to build simple command line interface, and it's really powerful for that. It has really a lot of capabilities. Basically, with just a few lines of code, you can create a command line interface with a name, description, a help page. It's very easy to add arguments either positional or an option that expects a value, and then you can simply parse them and use them in your Python script. Next library is TQDM, which apparently means progress in Arabic. I didn't know that. And it's even an abbreviation for I love you so much in Spanish. What TQDM does is that it gives you a progress bar, which is very helpful. And you can link this progress bar with anything that's happening in your code. For example, processing a pandas data frame or uh, collecting data from the internet or anything that you need to do that requires monitoring the progress. It's super lightweight and it easily integrates with a wide variety of projects. I'm just wondering how many of you are actually building command line interfaces regularly and what do you typically use them for? Let me know in the comments. Next library I want to talk about is X-Array and this is sort of a pandas but for multidimensional arrays. And this is designed to make working with multidimensional labeled data easily and fun. If you somehow think that dealing with multidimensional data is fun, which I'm not really sure <laughs> that it is. So what can you use this for? Well, it's great for scientific computing, data analysis, these kinds of things. It also interoperates very well with the scientific Python ecosystem, like uh, NumPy and Pandas and Matplotlib. X-Ray has a lot of feature, like for example, the possibility to interpolate data, you can group and bin data, and you also have very good support for multidimensional time series data. So if you're dealing with complex multidimensional data, X-Array is a really good choice for you. Next up is Polars, and this is a data frame library that's really optimized for speed. It's written in Rust, but you can also use it in Python, and it's going to use that same performance engine underlying both of these implementations. Polars is in particularly helpful if you're dealing with really large data sets because it can handle those much better than something like Pandas. It's blazingly fast. It can also be used with multi-threading. So this is a great choice for heavy computational tasks. Next is Seaborn, which is a library for statistical data visualization. So this is built on top of Matplotlib. And the nice thing about this is that it can create these beautiful looking charts and graphs very easily without having to provide tons and tons of options. So it comes out of the box with a nice style. If you want to plot something, you just provide the data and a couple of settings, depending on what you want, but it's pretty limited and you're going to get beautiful charts automatically. What's nice about Seaborn is that it has themes and color palettes. For example, if you have a function like this and then plot that with matplotlib, then you're going to get something that looks like this. With Seaborn, you simply set a theme and then it's going to already look a lot better. But then you can actually choose different themes. For example, here's a dark style, there's a white style, um, there's a ticks style. So it has a lot of different options. You can even choose different color palettes so that the charts and graphs also easily fit within the style of your application. The next library that I want to mention is Result. And this is kind of an outlier because it's a pretty a basic idea, but the idea of result is that it allows you to do so-called railroad oriented programming. And I talked about that in a video a long time ago, which if you want to watch that, I'll put a link at the top. But the idea is that this is an alternative to handling errors using exceptions. So normally, or what most people would do is that if you have a problem in your program, like you can't find a file or something or a network connection closes or whatever, um, or your uh, input values are wrongly formatted, you've raised an error, right? And you use Python's exception framework for that. Not everybody likes that because that creates sort of a control flow that's outside of your main program. An alternative way of doing that, and this is an idea that comes from the functional programming domain, is that instead of returning just a result value and optionally raising an error, that you actually have a result value that can either be okay, and in that case you get the value, or it can be an error, and in that case you get an error. So that leads to like two parallel paths in your function calling, and that's why it's also called railroad-oriented programming. And then basically, as long as everything's fine, you're just on the OK path, but as soon as there's a problem, well, then you go to the error path. And the result library provides some tooling and types to help you do that more easily. So there is a result type that gets basically 
the value that you expect from this particular function and an error value in this case uses a string and then in the code itself you simply handle those cases so for example if there is no user then we're going to return an error if the user is not active we're also going to return the error and otherwise we're going to return the actual user and then you can use an if statement to check which of these uh, things you have to deal with and if you're using a recent version of python then you can even use match case statements to deal with the different types of returns that you could get from this function now, i do think that it would be even better if this was integrated more into the language itself but if you don't like exceptions then this might be a nice option for you next one this library you probably know is called pydantic and pydantic is a really cool data validation library or Python. You can use this to validate data on the fly and basically catch errors before they become bugs in your program. What's cool about this is that Pydantic is used by quite a few different libraries in the Python ecosystem and it also works well with type annotations. Now one library in particular that it works really well with is FastAPI and that's actually the next library on our list which you probably also know. Now FastAPI is a modern web framework for building backend APIs with Python it's really easy to get started with it. I much prefer FastAPI over Flask because I think it has just better tooling and overall it has more support for modern Python features. So for example, it supports uh, concurrency and async await out of the box. Uh, it also uses type annotations to define return types for the API and uses that also for uh, validation of input arguments. And what's really cool about FastAPI is that it automatically serves a documentation site using either the Swagger UI or Redoc. Now, if you're building a full application, a tool like FastAPI is just one of the tools you probably need. If you want to learn more about how to design a complete application from scratch, I have a free guide for you. You can get this at arion.co slash design guide. This contains the seven steps that I take whenever I design a new piece of software, and hopefully it helps you avoid some of the problems that I made in the past. So arion.co slash design guide to get your copy for free. Just enter your email address and you'll get it in your inbox. I've also put the link in the description of the video. Next library that I want to mention that integrates really well with FastAPI is SQL Model. And this is built on both Pydantic and SQL Alchemy. SQL Model is an ORM, an object relational mapping library. And that allows you to use objects, classes, and methods to manipulate objects in the database. So this allows you to connect your fast API applications to databases like uh, SQLite, MySQL, and more. And what's really cool about this is that this is built on similar ideas as fast API. So it uses modern Python type annotations in particular, so you don't need to learn any new syntax. And the way that this is set up is really intuitive. You can simply define a class that inherits from SQL model. So this defines the table and you provide the fields that should be in the table. And one thing that's also nice about SQL model is that it has an easy way to define relationships. You see an example of a team table and a hero table. A hero is part of a team, so it has a team ID. And we can indicate right in the model that this ID is a foreign key and refers to the ID of of a team. Well, there's tons of other features in SQL model as well. If you want me to do a full video about this, let me know in the comments. Final library I want to talk about is HTTPX. If you've used requests, you know that there are some limitations, especially when dealing with asynchronous requests. The request package doesn't really support it all that well. Now, HTTPX is a next generation HTTP client, and this supports a ton of extra features. For example, it has async support, it's also fully type annotated. You can do lots of things, including pulling connections, streaming. It has lots of features. Before I finish the video, I just want to give you a bonus library, and that is python.env. I use python.env all the time in my application to read key value pairs from a .env file, and then I can simply access them using environment variables in my code. What I like a lot about that is that it gives me a lot of flexibility and that I have lots of ways in which I could provide environment variables when running my code. So for example, if I run it in the cloud, I might decide to define those environment variables somewhere else and my code will still work. And locally, I can work with a .env file with the right key value pairs. Or I could even 
run the application in different contexts simply by switching the .n file or the values in the .n file. And finally, this also promotes that you shouldn't put those things directly in your code, but put them in a different place for security purposes. So I hope you enjoyed this list. If you have any other suggestions for libraries that are interesting to people, just post them in the comments below. So for some of the libraries I mentioned, I have a more in-depth video on my channel. For example, Fast API. If you're not using that yet, you definitely should. And you can watch this video next to get all the details about how to use it. Thanks for watching and take care.